we're going to be talking about all the different types of cells. Now, when we talk about any one part, we can, we can also identify whether that one cell organelle is present in an animal cell, present in a plant cell. Also, there are other types of cells which we're going to be studying today, like that of a prokaryotic cell. So, let's just start and let's see what all of this is all about. All right. So, first of all, first and foremost, we start with the basics. When we talk about cell, what exactly is a cell? Can I define a cell? And what is the definition? Cell can be defined as, or rather cells are called as the basic structural and functional units of life. All right. Now over here, when we're studying cell, when we are going to be understanding what is the cell and what are its constituents, then this kind of study is going to be called as cytology or cell biology, where you know that the word logy means study and the word cyto is always referring to cell. So there is cytology or cell biology for studying of cell. All right. Now, also when we are studying about cell, what exactly are the points that we want to focus on? We would be focusing on the study of its structure, okay, its functions. Means if I'm talking about any one given part of the cell also, then there will be a different definite structure for it. There will be a certain perform uh, a certain function that it has to perform. Also about the genetics of that cell, whether it is a prokaryotic, whether it is a eukaryotic, then what exactly is the genetic configuration of it? How does it grow? Even its organization and also its reproduction. So when we're studying cell, these are all the pointers by which we will be approaching the study of any given cell. All right. So let's begin. First of all, there are so many different types of cells around you. Like, first of all, if you're talking about humans, then you know that the most, co the most common cell, which we know is running all around our body, this is the cell that's providing oxygen to each and every tissue of your body. It is none other than your red blood cell. So this over here is your red blood cell. Then there are other cells in our circulating fluid too, like your WBCs or your white blood cells too. All right. Even uh, there are cells which have cilia among them. Okay. So these are hair like projections for performing different functions. Then in the plants, there are cells like they are called as mesophyll cells. All right. And even plants have cells like tracheids. So there are so many different types of cells present in animals also present in plants also. So we're going to be studying those in detail in this chapter. Talking about cells, okay, look at this cell over here. It's called as PPLO, okay, it is also known as pleuropneumonia like organism. What is this? This is actually a mycoplasma and it is resistant to antibiotics, okay. What does it do? It is a bacteria. It is, in fact, the smallest bacteria and it causes a kind of pneumonia in human beings, okay. Now, let's see some interesting facts. In a human being, which exactly is the longest cell? It would be of a neuron. What is the largest cell ever there? That is an ostrich egg is the largest cell. And the, the smallest cell is that of a mycoplasma. All right. So these are the different types of cells which can be seen. Now, before we enter into any details of the cells, their cell organelles, their constituents, what are they made up of? Let's come and have a brief look at the history of cell. How exactly did this terminology of cell come into existence? Who were these scientists who were responsible for this? Okay, so first you have a scientist whose name is Robert Hooke. In the year 1665, Robert Hooke, okay, he had this, uh, he first invented a microscope. Okay, he was the one who prepared the first compound microscope. All right, now in this compound microscope, what did he do? He put a slide of a cot. Cot means coming from the tree's bark. So he took a slide and he put a piece of the cork inside the microscope to observe it. And under the microscope, he observed that this piece of cork looked like, or this whole, the whole part of the tree bark, it looked like a honeycomb-like appearance, okay? So he called it as the cork cambium, where it gave a honeycomb-like appearance, okay? These, actually, these honeycomb-like appearance, that these small compartments that are seen over here, these are nothing but cell walls, okay? So, uh, because it gave a compartment-like appearance, 
that's why he used the word the, the name cellula to describe it because the word cellula basically means small compartment all right so that's where the whole word of cell came into existence because under the microscope those that slice of the bark of the tree appeared like small compartments all right also we see who is this person this person was called as robert hook what did he do he is the one who prepared the first compound microscope and he is the one who first used the term of cell now ahead of this we saw other another scientist who was named as anton van leeuwenhoek now anton van leeuwenhoek he created a replica of that first microscope which was made by robert hook so the first the first microscope after that anton van leeuwenhoek hook made a replica of it and also he found the existence and reported the existence of other cells too which other cells cells found in our body for example the sperm the rbc even bacteria even these are cells too which he reported by viewing into his own compound microscope which he created so you can see over here that this is a diagram of the compound microscope which was made by anton van leeuwenhoek all right now if you see over here this is the exact this is the region where the lens is okay and that is exactly where the slide would be would be placed so that if at all it's viewed from this angle then the person the scientist could observe that slide quite clearly all right ahead we see that in a cell the most important constituent that we find and the most prominent constituent that we find would be of the nucleus so the nucleus here was discovered by robert brown in the year 1831 so in any cell okay the founder or the person who discovered a cell was robert hook but the person who discovered the nucleus was named as robert brown so don't forget these two people who was the one who prepared the next compound microscope his name was anton van leeuwenhoek all right now after robert brown and he prepared the cell the nucleus what we see is there is there are two scientists named as schleden and schwann all right now schleden and schwann both together one being a botanist one being a zoologist they proposed a theory which was applicable to almost every cell all right so this was also called as a cell theory or a cell doctrine now when i say that this is a cell theory then basically it means that if it is a given if the given thing structure in front of you is a cell then it has to actually follow all of those pointers and once all of those pointers are fulfilled are followed only then can we call it as a cell so when we say that a cell theory has been made what exactly are the pointers of this cell theory let's have a look into those okay and before we go into that also there is one word which when we study about the cell it's called as protoplasm so this protoplasm was first used the word protoplasm okay you might have heard of the word cytoplasm but now this is a new term and this is called as protoplasm so first of all let's just understand that the word protoplasm was used in animal cells by a person or scientist called as purkinje and this very same word was also used for plant cells by none other than hugo van hugo von moll so purkinje for animal cells hugo von moll for plant cells both of them said that the living cells are made up of protoplasm so now the next point comes to what exactly is protoplasm here it is here is your cell okay we all know until now that this given region over here is the nucleoplasm means the constituents which are found inside the nuclear region these constituents inside the nuclear region would be called as the nucleoplasm and the very same constituents which are found in the remaining part of the cell that is where all the cell organelles are all of this region that is the part which we are going to be calling as the cytoplasm so what do we see here that when we talk about the whole cell being put together then the whole cell put together will have not only nucleoplasm but also cytoplasm 
so cytoplasm and nucleoplasm both of them put together is what we are going to be calling as the protoplasm of the cell so when we talk about protoplasm protoplasm is cytoplasm plus nucleoplasm okay and this was given for animal cells by Perkin J and for plant cells by Hugo van Moll. All right. So let's continue. When we spoke about cell theory and I told you that it was given forward by the two scientists, Schleiden and Schwann. So let's see what exactly were the points which are covered in cell theory. First of all, the most basic point that if the organism is a living organism, then it has to be made up of cells. So, all living organisms are made up of cells. Okay. Also, we see that cells are the basic structural and the functional unit of life. That's the basic definition that we have of a cell. Also, we see cells, they contain genetic information, all right, like in the form of DNA or in the form of RNA. So, basically, cells contain genetic information and when the cell divides, okay, when, whenever the cell undergoes cell division, that time that genetic information is going to be passed from one cell to another cell, all right. So, all of that division is going to result in the passage of genetic information from parent cell to a daughter cell, all right. After this, we see that cells basically they're not only similar in their shape and the structure. They are also similar in their chemical compositions. Like for example, if we talk about the nucleus of a given cell, then the nuclear components are going to be the same in all the cells. If it is a nucleus, then it has to be composed of a certain material. If it is a cell membrane, if it is a plasma membrane, then it has to be composed of a, of a given material. Whether it is that of an animal cell, whether it is that of a plant cell. But if it is a cell membrane, then it's always going to be made up of the same chemical composition. And also, when we talk about the metabolic activities, metabolic activities, what exactly is metabolism? First, let's talk about that. When we talk about metabolic activities, we need activities like what a cell performs. For example, respiration. For example, photosynthesis. All of these are activities in which breakdown process is happening and building up process is happening too. So the process where there is breaking down and then there is building up activities both happening at the same time then this is called as a metabolic activity. So when we have the process of metabolism okay metabolism includes two processes put together. The first process is that where you're going to be breaking down something. And for breaking down, we'll use the terminology which is called as catabolism. Okay. And for the second process, we're going to be building up something. So building up something would mean anabolism. Okay. So breaking down, breaking and anabolism for building. So when we talk about breaking and building both put together, I will call this as catabolism and anabolism. Both of these activities happening is called as metabolism. So we see here that cells are similar in their chemical composition and in their metabolic activities. All right. We also see that each and every cell is always going to be coming into existence because of a previously existing cell. Okay, so all the cells arise from pre-existing cell. Now, if I ask you, the human body, how does the human body exactly start? Won't you tell me that, ma'am, it starts with a unicellular zygote? Yes or no? That is the very beginning of that cell. But that unicellular zygote, where did that come from? Didn't that unicellular zygote come from the fusion of two different gametes and those gametes are cells? So, the egg and the sperm came together and they formed a unicellular zygote. That zygote is the one that's going to give rise to this multicellular baby that's going to come into existence. So that's why we say that all cells are arising from pre-existing cells. 
and who is it exactly that gave this or that postulated this theory it was none other than rudolf virchow in the year 1858 so it was rudolf virchow who stated that all cells arise from pre-existing cells okay also we see that cells are uh, self duplicating and self contained units which means that cells have first of all their own genetic material and we know that genetic material like dna has is autonomous means it can it has a, a tendency of self replication it can replicate on its own and also they are self contained units so for a cell to function even you know even if we are talking about a very simple unicellular organism then to that organism only on one cell can manage to survive and that's why we say that cells can be self contained units because even those unicellular organisms can survive on their own all right okay now we also see this new terminology which i'd like you to pay attention on here some cells are said to be totipotent now the main question here is what exactly is totipotency when we talk about totipotent cells then these are the cells which are able to give rise to other types of cells generally let's say you hurt your skin somewhere you've injured your skin somewhere and you need because there is an injury there it's a natural tendency for your body to start the or initiate the process of repairing so you would ultimately know that a new layer of skin some day will come up right within a couple of days but what happens is here the old skin layer is giving rise to the new skin layer only but there are certain cells in our body which are capable enough to give rise to new types of cells over here skin gives rise to a new skin layer okay but there are certain cells which can give rise to a different cell altogether and these kind of cells which are able to give, divide and give rise to new cells that is the process which we call as totipotency so talking about the cell totipotency first of all why this word totipotency the word totus comes from the word entire and potency potential which means power this means that this one cell has the entire power within itself to give rise to a complete new different type of cell okay now so what he, what look at the exact definition here totipotency is the ability of a single cell to divide and to produce any type of cell in an organism okay so what is it able to do it is able to divide and it is able to produce any type of cell okay where in an organism and then it is able it is going to be able to form a complete new organism all right over here the examples given are an that of an embryonic cell you know that when the embryo is developing all the different organs are not present so it is those initial cells which are going to have the ability to give rise to different types of cells okay so these cells in the initial stage you can see over here first this is the uh zygote being formed when the zygote divides further forms a 16 cell morula stage over here so that's the morula stage and then that's going to grow even further so these cells over here which are there inside here these cells are able to give rise to new types of cells and because they are able to give rise to new types of cells those cells are said to be totipotent okay so those are totipotent cells all right and those are none other than the stem cells of our human body where are these stem cells found these stem cells can be found only when the female is pregnant and also while delivery when the baby's umbilical cord is cut the blood which would come out of that would be the blood which contains stem cells nowadays if you've heard there's a lot of uh there are a lot of options for storing that blood because they're containing these stem cells and that whole process is called as stem cell banking all right so stem cells are totipotent cells now when we talk about the organization you have one cell so how is it that when we talk about this any given one cell it comes together and we have a whole multicellular organism 
So basically, when we start off, when we start off with one cell, then if you look at this cell here, which cell is this? This is the neuron. Okay, this is the neuron. Now when we talk about the neuron, and if we have many such neurons, means I'm talking about cells which are similar. I'm talking only about neurons being put together. So if we talk about many such neurons put together, then they would come together and they would form a tissue. Then this tissue would come together and it would form an organ. The organ with other organs come together to form an organ system. And then finally, these organ systems or many organ systems will have a proper sync and coordination between themselves. And that is what gives rise to our organism. So if we see, this is the actual hierarchy, this is the actual pathway that is followed, that is all the whole organism, the basic structural and functional unit is a cell. Many similar cells, similar in what, what ways, could be similar in shape, in structure, in function. They come together and they're going to be forming a tissue. The tissues come together, form an organ. Organs come together, different organs would come together to form a particular system. And when there is a synchronization amongst all the systems together, that is what gives rise to our organism, all right? So that is what cell organization was all about. Now talking to talking about the basic characteristics of a cell, we first learned what cell theory was, all right? Who was it that proposed cell theory? It was Schleiden and Schwann. Talking about the characteristics of a cell, we see that first and foremost, the definition. Cell is the basic structural and functional unit of life, okay? It is made up of protoplasm and that protoplasm is enclosed by means that surrounding the protoplasm there is a plasma membrane and that plasma membrane is made up of lipoprotein. What is lipoprotein? Okay, so first of all there is a cell. Inside the cell there is cytoplasm and nucleoplasm. Remember both of them put together was what we called as protoplasm. What is, the, what is that plasma membrane made up of which is surrounding the protoplasm? It is made up of lipoproteins. Now, when I say this word lipoproteins, okay, lipo means lipids, means fats, okay. When I say the word proteins, lipoprotein. So basically, if I'm saying it is a lipoprotein, then it is a compound which is made up of, or rather it is a layer which is made up of both fats as well as of proteins, all right? So that is that in every cell, there's going to be protoplasm and that protoplasm is going to be surrounded by a plasma membrane. What is the plasma membrane going to be made up of? A lipoprotein, all right? Okay, then we also see the cytoplasm contains cell organelles, okay? They prepare proteins, cells prepare proteins, cells have nucleus and the nucleus have genetic material in the form of DNA mostly. Also, we see that the cells can self-duplicate and we also see that as we spoke about a little while back that each cell arises from a pre-existing cell. And who was it who put that forward? It was none other than Rudolf Virchow. Now, this whole statement that each cell arises from a pre-existing cell, this statement can also be called as omnis cellular e cellular. All right, what is it called as? Omnis cellular e cellular. This means that each cell arises from a pre-existing cell. Okay. So that was the whole characteristics of a cell. We also learned about certain scientists, how the history of cell came into existence. Okay, now let's come to the basic types of cells which we're going to be seeing. They could be either a prokaryotic cell or they may be a eukaryotic cell. So now what exactly is the basic difference between these? Let's see that. When we talk about, first of all, a, either it is a prokaryotic or a eukaryotic. In both of these words, you can see it has the common suffix and that suffix is carrion. Carrion word means nucleus. Okay, so when we talk about carrion, you know you're talking about nucleus. Prokaryon means a primitive nucleus. Eukaryon means a true nucleus. 
So when we talk about prokaryotic, here we say here it is a primitive nucleus, eukaryotic have a true nucleus. When we talk about this prokaryotic cells, we're basically going to be learning about bacteria. The prokaryotic cells around you are your bacteria, and the eukaryotic cells are none other than the animal cells and the plant cells too. So these are going to be two cells which are having a true nucleus. Can you locate the nucleus over here? Here is the nucleus for the animal cell and here is the nucleus for the plant cell. Alright, so there are properly membrane bound nucleus found in the eukaryotic cell and not at all found like that in the prokaryotic ones. Alright, so here we see that uh, the nuclear membrane, the nucleolus and nucleoplasm, all the three are present when we talk about eukaryotic cells. Alright, now when we talk about these cells, let's not forget about the five kingdom system. Who proposed it? It was proposed by R.H. Whittaker and here he is. So R.H. Whittaker said that there are five kingdoms totally. Okay, out of those five kingdoms, first of all, we see that there is a differentiation between the five kingdoms would be first beginning with kingdom Monera, kingdom Protista, Plantae, Fungus and Animalia. So now, amongst all of these uh, different kingdoms that, are, that have been put forward, unicellularity is seen in monera and in protista so both of these here are unicellular so this is unicellular even this one is unicellular and the plantae multi fungus multicellular animalia also multicellular so first of all we differentiate the different types of cells either unicellular or multicellular then we see here that both Monera and Protista are unicellular. But then where does the difference lie? The difference between these two kingdoms are lying in the type of nucleus. So we see that the Monerans, they have a primitive nucleus. So we can call them as prokaryotes. Whereas the Protestants, they have a true nucleus. So we may call them as eukaryotes. All right. So the basic difference between Monera and Protista. Although they both are unicellular, but monerans are going to be having prokaryotic type of cell, whereas the protists are all eukaryotic and they have a proper centrally or they have a proper nucleus which is functioning, which has a membrane around it too. All right. Okay. So now we're going to, we're going to begin this whole session with studying about a prokaryotic cell. Okay. Now, when we talk about prokaryotic cell, always remember, we are talking all about the bacteria around you. All right. So this given cell that you're seeing here is a prokaryotic cell and it is the cell of a bacteria. Now, we see here that a bacteria basically on an average, it has a diameter of one micrometer. All right. A, di a diameter of one micrometer on an average. We see that different bacteria may have different forms to it or different shapes to it. If it is a circular shape, we would call it as a cocci or coccus. If it is having a rod shape, then we would call it as bacilli or bacillus. If it is a comma shaped bacteria, we can call it as vibrio. Okay. And if it is a spiral shaped bacteria, we can call it as spirilla. So basically bacteria can be found in four different forms, four different shapes, cocci, bacilli, Vibrios and spirilla. Now, when we see here, when we see the def, the basic structure of a bacteria or the generalized structure of a prokaryote, first and foremost, we see that the outermost layer of this prokaryote is surrounded by, or rather, it is made up of a, a layer which is called as a cell envelope. Okay. So now, when we're talking about in the cell envelope, look at this here. It has got one, two and three layers to it. So these three layers are mentioned here. The outermost layer being called as the glycocalyx, the middle layer called as the cell wall and the innermost layer called as the plasma membrane. So this is going to be outer, cell wall will be middle and plasma membrane will be inner. All right. So that is how the whole structure goes. 
talking about only the glycocalyx remember glycocalyx is the outermost layer okay so talking about the glycocalyx it is the outermost layer what is it made up of it is made up of macromolecules which can adhere to the bacteria it can stick on to the bacteria okay these are micro macromolecules macromolecules indicating that these are going to be huge and big sized molecules that's about the glycocalyx now sometimes in certain bacteria this glycocalyx may be thin where you can call it as a slime layer if it's thin and if it is thick then it may be called as a capsule so depending on the thickness of this glycocalyx either you may call it as a slime layer or we may call it as a capsule and basically whether it is thin or whether it is thick this glycocalyx layer is going to be made up of polysaccharides okay they are made up of polysaccharides what is a polysaccharide nothing but sugars put together all right many sugars many glucose molecules come together and they form a polysaccharide where poly basically means many and saccharide means sugar so that's why we say that this glycocalyx structure is nothing but a carbohydrate. Okay, it is a carbohydrate. Next, talking about the next layer, outermost was called as the glycocalyx. Next to that is called as the cell wall. Now, when we talk about the cell wall, it's present below, means inner to the glycocalyx. It is made up of peptidoglycan. Okay, now when I say peptidoglycan, peptide indicates a presence of a protein and glycan indicates the presence of carbohydrate. So when we talk about the cell wall, it is a combination of both proteins as well as of carbohydrates over there. It also provides definite shape to that whole cell. Okay, and that's the reason why we have the different shapes like that of the round one, the rod shaped one, the comma shaped one or the spiral one. All of the shapes are there because of the presence of the cell wall, which is giving a definite shape to it and also giving it a structural support. All right. Now, coming to the next layer, that is the innermost layer of this cell envelope. And that innermost layer is that of the plasma membrane. Okay. The plasma membrane is just like the plasma membrane, which we will be studying about the eukaryotic cells. Plasma membranes here are made up of lipoproteins too. Lipoproteins. Lipo means fats. Okay. So this is going to be a combination of fats as well as proteins put together making the cell membrane. All right. It has respiratory enzymes as well. Okay. And these respiratory enzymes are going to be helping in metabolic activities. Do you remember what metabolism was all about? Remember if I told that I told you metabolism. Metabolism is catabolism plus anabolism. Okay, together this is forming metabolism. All right. Now, since we are done with the cell envelope, remember the cell envelope had three layers to them. Which were those three layers? The glycocalyx, the cell wall and the plasma membrane. So once we're done studying all those three layers, we come next to the interior parts of the cell. And those that interior material of the cell can be called as cytoplasm. So now when we talk about cytoplasm of a prokaryotic cell, remember all of these points we're studying about bacteria and bacteria are the prokaryotic cells. So now we see here that the cytoplasm here is of a semi-fluid consistency. Okay, and... It does not show a process which is called as cyclosis. Okay, so what exactly is cyclosis? Let's talk about that first. Cyclosis means when the cytoplasm inside the cell is able to rotate. And while the cytoplasm is moving in a streaming motion, all the nutrition is also going to be circulating in the cell. But when we talk about a prokaryotic cell, that cytoplasm is not rotating inside. So we say that if there is no streaming movements happening and it does not show the process of cyclosis. What is cyclosis? Can I call it as streaming? It is streaming movement of the cytoplasm. Streaming movement of the cytoplasm. 
it does not the cytoplasm actually being a prokaryotic cell there are no membrane bound organelles which means that you know when i'm talking about a nucleus also then the nucleus also has a membrane around it and then there will be nucleoplasm inside so here in the prokaryotic cells there are absolutely no such cell organelles which are confined to a particular boundary which means that there is no membrane bound organelles present here also it has chromatophores okay and inclusions like glycogen starch phosphates sulfates this these inclusions are how it's going to be storing its food all right also we see here can you see this prokaryotic cell over here if you pay attention and look in this layer over here there is an infold so when you see this infold it can call it can be called as an invagination and this invagination which is present is called as a mesosome what is the function of the mesosome it is believed that the mesosome is the layer which is actually going to be giving rise to the cell wall remember the cell wall is a part of the cell envelope remember the cell envelope had three parts to it glycocalyx next part was cell wall and third part was called as plasma membrane so it is believed that this mesosome is the one is that invagination which is giving rise to the cell wall then we also find the presence of small ribosomes if you can see over here okay ribosomes how does this ribosome look like and what function does it do ribosomes are basically small units which are made up of two different subunits one is going to be a small subunit the second one being a larger subunit now one thing you need to remember ribosomes are found to be of different structure different size and shape in different types of cells so when we talk about the ribosome of a prokaryotic cell yes ribosomes all over are going to do one function and that is of making proteins so ribosomes are called as protein factories but when we talk about the ribosomes of a prokaryotic cell then it is actually having a two different units a small and a large subunit it depends upon the settling rate of this ribosome when it is centrifuged and the rate of settling is given a unit called as swedberg's unit because it is swedberg's using unit we use the letter s and that's why everywhere you can see an s and what is this indicate first look at this whole equation it's written that 70s is equal to 50s plus 30s so basically over here don't put maths together when we talk about 50s this is the rate at which the large subunit is settling down 30s is the rate at which the small subunit settles down during centrifugation but then what is 70s 70s indicates that when both the large and the small subunit are taken together and are centrifuged then because the density of it changes that's why it is settling at a rate of 70s so over here because the density of the ribosome put together is different from the densities of them individually units that's why this equation is not a additional equation okay so when we talk about the ribosome of a prokaryotic cell it can be written as 70s is the whole unit together is 50s that is of the larger subunit and 30s of the smaller subunit so this is how we can describe the ribosome of a prokaryotic prokaryotic cell all right next we see here that uh, when we talk about the nucleus here we know that it is a very primitive nucleus okay so because there is some structure which is looking like a nucleus it is not a nucleus it is like a nucleus so when we have the word like we can use the suffix oid oid basically means like so because it is like a nucleus we will go ahead and we can call it as a nucleoid so where exactly is the nucleoid here this whole structure that you are seeing here is the nucleoid of this prokaryotic cell the nucleoid is the part where the genetic material of this cell is going to be found 
here also the nucleoid does not have any membrane around it so we say that there is no membrane bound nucleus neither is there going to be any presence of any nucleoplasm present here either but it does have genetic material and that genetic material is DNA but the DNA is a little different than ours our DNA is going to be a helical structure right over here the DNA is single it is circular and it is double stranded so over here our day our DNA is a helical structure in the case of a bacteria they have a circular DNA okay and we also see that the nucleoid okay we're talking back we're talking about the nucleoid this nucleoid is going to be connected to the plasma membrane remember plasma membrane was the inner part of the cell envelope by what by the mesosome what was the mesosome if you remember mesosomes were small invaginations so the nucleoid will be connected to plasma membrane with the help of those invaginations which we named as the mesosomes here also in the nucleoid because it is not a true nucleus there will be no nuclear membrane no nucleolus and no nucleoplasm either there is one very important structure in that of a bacteria which we can call as the plasmids okay so over here you can see bacterial dna and also plasmid dna plasmids basically you need to understand that these are the reasons why this is actually the reason why the structure of a bacteria is so strong this is also the reason why bacteria may or your body may start developing resistance sometimes when you go to the doctor and the doctor asks you to finish the whole course of an antibiotic it is so that that bacteria does not develop or your body does not develop resistance against that antibiotic if your body starts developing resistance then that antibiotic will not work on you and if the antibiotic doesn't work on you the bacteria would not be able to be killed so that resistance that is found is because of the presence of plasmids there so here this is an actual this is an additional dna which is present in this prokaryotic cell and that is an additional circular dna so besides the nucleoid dna is also present in the plasmids it is autonomous and it is self replicating okay just like that of a normal dna and it produces properties like what we just spoke about right now drug resistance okay and even nitrogen fixing even fertility of that cell so basically it is the plasmid which is making this bacterial cell to enable it to become so strong all right so look at this here we spoke about the different ribosomes we spoke about the prokaryotic ribosome right now remember prokaryotic ribosome was 70s okay and that would be 50s plus 30s that is that of a prokaryotic but what about the eukaryotic ribosome it was put together as 80s is 60s plus 40s all right so when we spoke about the ribosomes this was the bifurcation we learned about the prokaryotic one now in our next lecture for the ntsc batch we're going to be continuing this chapter and we will be learning more about the cell organelles but now the ones which are belonging to the eukaryotic cells so prokaryotes were all about bacteria and now eukaryotes are all going to be about plant as well as animal cells all right so see you in the next lecture till then you guys stay home and